I'm joined today by David Waters, uh, the host of Gators Breakdown. He does a fantastic job uh, covering the Gators in the podcast arena. Obviously, he knows a lot about the program. And so uh, we're just going to talk to you today about a few topics in advance of Thursday's Gasparilla Bowl. Uh, you know that UCF fans are amped up. It's one of the only bowl games that is sold out. I think it's the playoff games in this game. Uh, I know I know Florida fans are amped up. I mean, maybe some maybe don't want to admit they are, but obviously with an in-state matchup, there's family connections with a lot of people and it's a convenient game. So what would you say is the Gator Nation reaction to playing UCF in this bowl game? Yeah, of course, you know, not a, the, the, the fan base is used to power five games, you know, under Dan Mullen, it was the, uh, you know, all these New Year's six games, you had the Peach Bowl, and then you had the Orange Bowl, and then the Cotton Bowl last year, which was a disaster versus Oklahoma, but then you know, a disaster of a season lands to Dan Mullen's firing, and Florida finally gets bowl eligible in the last game of the season versus FSU, shooting at least to the Gasparilla Bowl, right, versus UCF, and yeah, I, I do think if, if Florida was playing Anybody that was not an in-state, um, an in-state school, you'd already played FSU, of course, in the last game of the season. But being matched up with UCF in Tampa in the Gasparilla Bowl, of course, it heightens the interest of, of the game. Florida, Florida doesn't want to lose to UCF. Two and zero so far, of course, in, in in the in the program's history when these two teams have met up, and you know, of course, they'll be meeting in the future as well. So, uh, but Gus Malzahn coming over from Auburn now at UCF, so you get that uh, you know, SEC tie-in from. Uh, uh, from Gus Malzahn's tie, ties at, at Auburn. But now, of course, you know, Florida being able to, you know, I guess say uh, a couple angles here. You can end the season with a winning record at the at seven and six. So there, there's one, as you said, there's a family aspect to it. There's, um, I'm, I'm sure players have went against each other in the state, all these in-state kids going, uh, going in, um, whether to be teammates, they could be former teammates, they could be uh, past opponents at uh, rival high schools or something. So, of course, there's that angle of it too. And then Greg Knox, I mean, here's one outside angle of it. He's 2-0 as an interim coach. He took over for Dan Mullen at Mississippi State as an interim coach uh, and won the Gator Bowl that year. Of course, interim coach versus FSU in the last game of this season. So I'm sure, you know, in back of his mind, he's like, yeah, you know, even though I'm an interim, I, I'd like to go undefeated a bit if I can. Uh, and you know, a lot of these coaches, too, you hope there's some kind of pride there as well of kind of um, – whether they're auditioning for their next job, the players the same way. You mentioned that there's players in the transfer portal, uh, but also for these Florida players, it's the first time you know, Billy Napier's going to be on these sidelines is in, in bowl prep when they go to Tampa. He's going to be watching these practices. He's been watching these practices for the last week uh, as well, and then you get to go out there under the spotlight of a Gasparilla Bowl Thursday night, and I'm sure Billy Napier will be watching that game as well. So I think this is a, a first chance for a lot of these guys and a last chance for a lot of these guys as well. Go out there with their teammates one more time, send these seniors out, uh, with, with one more win. Uh, so, yeah, there, I, there's still plenty to play for now. We've seen this Gator team at times this year look like they did not want to be on the field. You go to uh, the South Carolina game this year where you, even when you had Dan Mullen, you had your head coach, you didn't look like you wanted to be on the field uh, at all. But I still think there's, that there's plenty of incentive out there for uh, a lot of the angles, coaches, players. And as you said, fans too. The game sold out. There's interest there. So uh, this is not a, this is not a throw it away game, I don't think. I'll ask you about uh, Billy Napier. I, I think if we would have spoken a year ago and then would have talked about a coaching change, if it wasn't Dan Mullen maybe going on his own somewhere, but rather being fired, I mean, you probably would have laughed if someone would have brought that up. But here we are. Uh, yeah. you know, I know he, he kind of got a, a semi vote of confidence at one point, and then that Stanford game seemed to kind of seal his fate. But from day one, you know, and you're, you were, I'm sure you were in tune to all the rumors and everything else. It seemed like everything always centered around Billy Napier. Like there was, was there even, even an, another credible rumor, but it seems like everything was focused on him and just kind of waiting. I know he has, he's particular about timelines. He's dedicated to his previous job and didn't want to put them in a bad position, wanted to coach that final game with Louisiana and everything. So what's kind of been the, the initial reaction to the hire? Is it, you know, the fan base supportive, kind of have question marks. How are people kind of feeling about the hire of Billy Napier? Yeah, I think they feel pretty good even after uh, we're, what, five days after signing day uh, as well. And then there were some questions after he was hired. You know, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with the most recent first. Of course, there were transfers, uh, announcements. There were decommitments in the current class. And every, a lot of Gator fans were wondering, oh, you know, what, what, what happened here? What, what, what's going on? We're, 
this natural transition of a, of a coaching change. And that's what happened there. And he was able to save it just a bit on signing day uh, with some big signees that he was able to, to keep away from Georgia uh, in Notre Dame. Devin Moore started that day uh, and you've got Gator Nation going uh, with an early commitment there. Kamari Wilson, Shamar James, two big targets that Georgia was after. So if there was, was some question there, he kind of um, – gathered it all back together and let the and gave the fan base a sigh of relief a little bit on on signing day but going back to the uh, uh, the the week of you know Dan Mullen getting fired and who's going to be the next coach as you said Billy Napier was it was he was targeted he was zoomed in on and yeah you may have heard Bob Stoops name again like you hear for every other <laughs> every other uh, job right every other every other job and every other Florida coaching search since uh Steve Spurrier retired. You, it, it's Bob Stoops, Bob Stoops, Bob Stoops. Whether Florida fired Jim McElwain, Will Muschamp, uh, Dan Mullen, Bob Stoops' name was always going to come up. Uh, but Billy Napier did seem the, to be the big top target that Scott Strickland uh, was going after. Visited Napier. That was the only interview he did in the whole process. He was sold the first time he met Billy Napier. And now you can say, here, sit here and say what all the other big coaching hires that were made, Brian Kelly at LSU, Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma to go to USC. Uh, there was some question, what does Scott Strickland really do his due diligence? And then the reports that came out that Brian Kelly was interested in Florida and Lincoln Riley was interested in Florida. But Scott Strickland had his guy. He went and did his research. He said he watched YouTube videos, went back and, and just to kind of see the, the type of person that he was getting. This is not necessarily – um, needing to hear it from somebody else. There was, these, there was these things he wanted to see for himself. He said, and this was really interesting. He said, one that caught his eye, just something probably nobody else would have caught. Billy Napier sitting there doing a post-game interview and in a, in a, in a scrum after a game and uh, not really like a, a room. He's just sitting in a tunnel of a, a, of a stadium and he stops the media scrum just to let people go by and let them do their job. And Scott Strickland was like, you know what, that right there spoke to me more than anything. Anything he said in the press conference, anything anybody else could have told me about him, that right there kind of let me know the type of person he is. But then, of course, he had to do his research and talk to past people and, and, and connections there. And it looks like Billy Napier is the, the detail-oriented um, target that he wanted to go for sustainability in the Florida program. And that's where it really starts. I mean, for as good as Dan Mullen was as an on-field coach and his coaching acumen, you know, the day he was hired, he was the number one choice I wanted for Florida, but it was always the question, could he recruit at the level of Alabama and Georgia for sustained success at Florida? And he wasn't doing it. And so I do think Scott Strickland did a lot of research and going to find somebody who could build sustained success, not just the uh, flash in the pan type of success and somebody that's going to go head to head with Georgia and Alabama on the recruiting trail. And we got an inkling of that on signing day. Of course, we need to see more of it, uh, but it was a, um, a really – this is the guy. I love him. I want him. I'm going to go get him. And he got him. Okay. So obviously uh, signing day, you mentioned there were some signing day wins. Uh, I know in the days leading up to it, it was a little bit tense with guys <laughs> committing. I, Uncle Luke, I mean, obviously I noticed when he was saying he kind of put Florida on blast, but he was always going to do that anyway. I, I think I jumped in yeah. one of his Twitter spaces and kind of listened to him rant for a few minutes. But uh, obviously I know you just said, you know, there was some excitement over some signing they went to where did they kind of go from here because obviously not every you know most schools have a lot of scholarships left in the bag UCF has about 10 spots that you know they're hoping to use on transfers is, is transfer portal is that where Napier's probably going to use the bulk I mean there are some guys that did not sign early but not a lot is transfer portal probably where he goes and you know for for the spots left over yeah, I think so. I do think uh, it may even get two quarterbacks. I think one out of the portal, one signed in, in, as a recruiting class as well. Florida only signed nine, by the way. So Florida still has a lot of spots left, whether it's going to be through the transfer portal, whether it's going to be high school recruiting. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, I think they'll get a linebacker out of Louis, or, or try and get a linebacker out of the state of Louisiana. Uh, Billy Napier's first visits after he did his opening press conference as a Florida Gator on a Sunday, he was in Louisiana, back in Louisiana on a Monday, the day after that, visiting Trevante Citizen and Trevor Etienne, two top 150, 200 running backs there. I think Florida is really in play for one of those. Linebacker T.J. Dudley, he's a four-star linebacker. Um, so I think, you know, Florida will be kind of going after uh, – those two be hitting high school recruits as well who did not make an early uh, commitment or early signee. Uh, on early signing day but yeah the portal's gonna have to be hit hard Florida does need help up front at wide uh, at offensive line and defensive line once again 
Uh, those, so I do think Florida will hit the transfer portal. Plenty of spots left open for it. Uh, and as we said, there's transfers out for Florida. Emma Jones – more than likely transferring out Jacob Copeland, Mamu Diabate's put his name in as well, and a few others. I think Florida has six or seven, if I if I, if I remember right. And you can get up to seven now if you, right. it's kind of a trade, you know, the, the trade in, trade out uh, for the transfer portal. So I do think you know Florida is going to take full advantage of being able to to, to make up for the, some of the transfers that are going out and bring some more in as well. So uh, we'll talk about Emory Jones in a moment, but you know, talk about uh, quarterback for UF. I mean, Anthony Richardson, obviously. Had the injury, he had the, what, the meniscus surgery recently, so he's obviously out for the bowl game. Would you pencil him? Is he kind of the quarterback of the future right now, or, or is transfer portal? Would would Napier look for some competition there? Uh, what do you think that dynamic is looking at quarterback for 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I still think even if he does look at transfer portal, I think it will be pretty clear uh, to whoever's out there. I mean, look, AR got a lot of hype <laughs> in this past season in limited uh, action. So I do think that plays into it as well. What transfer would really want to come into that, knowing that hype is there and knowing that more than likely Anthony Richardson probably will be the guy. And I do think Billy Napier will, will, will kind of land there as well, that he, that Anthony Richardson will be the quarterback or most, if he can go through spring practice, fall practice, uh, we'll have you know the, the leg up already in the competition uh, here. So, of course, you, you got to wonder if whenever spring practice starts, will Richardson be available? How fast can that recovery be? Will he be able to go through a, you know, a very important, I think, very right. first spring practice for Billy Napier uh, to come? You'd love to have Anthony Richardson go ahead and get the experience there, but that could play into it as well. You know, if the, if there's a setback, if there uh, is not a spring practice, can a guy transfer in, go through spring practice and really impress Billy Napier and say, okay, well, well what we went through in those – four weeks of spring practice here, you know, Anthony Richardson's got a lot of ground to make up with fall camp starts. So I think a lot of it will be determined. You know, can he sell these transfers on, on, we don't really know the injury status of Anthony Richardson, how fast he recover. You'll have a chance to compete in spring either way. Uh, and if he's not there, you may have a leg up in the competition. So I do think there's a lot to sell in, in this, but I do think if everything kind of goes as planned, if there's a late start to spring practice, which Billy Napier kind of been known for anyway, starting spring practice late, then there's probably enough time for Richardson to get back into right. the fold uh, and, and go and hit that. But I do think Anthony Richardson, if you ask me right now who's starting for quarterback next season, I'll go Anthony Richardson. Gotcha. Gotcha. But for this game, it's going to be Emory Jones, we think. Uh, we know the reports, I think, came out last week. Might have been Pete Tham of Yahoo put it out there that, you know, that wasn't a surprise that he's most likely going to hit the transfer portal. But Emory himself was retweeting it. He's not in the portal yet, which I guess is smart because, right, he wants to play in this game. And I don't know if there's many examples of guys, maybe we're going to see examples this year of guys who have announced their intent to leave and be in the portal, but they're still going to play. But it looks like, for as far as, as everything you guys know, Emory Jones and uh, leading receiver Jacob Copeland, who I believe is actually in the portal, he's playing. As far as you know, both Emory Jones and Copeland are playing in this game, correct? As far as I know, that's the, that is the plan. Uh, and you know, Florida even put out a, a practice video over the weekend, and Emory Jones was featured in it, throwing the ball. So. Okay. Uh, he's still practicing, uh, and as I said, that the report, as you said from Pete Thamel uh, last week, that he was going to play. Now I have heard behind the scenes that it was kind of if he if he was going to play, but I do think you know Florida sending out that video as well, showing that he's still practicing. I don't know why, you know, they send that video out on Saturday, I believe it could even okay. be Sunday if I if I remember right. If he's not playing, I don't think you put that video out there, or I don't think he's practicing. Why, why take the risk if you're not going to go play either? Um, if you know he he was injured the week of the FSU game in practice and right. ended up starting the game anyway. Uh, but uh, so you well, you wouldn't take an injury risk, I don't think, if you're not going to plan to play in the game. So I would expect Emory Jones to go out there and start. Uh, so who's behind him? Carlos Del Rio, Jalen Kitna. You know we've. <laughs> If anybody's watched Emory Jones this year, you don't know what kind of performance you're going to get. I mean, he's been a very, very turnover prone uh, when he's out there. If he goes and goes out there and throws three interceptions again, like he did versus FSU, would it be Jalen Kitna or Carlos Del Rio uh, taking snaps versus UCF if some of the way the games have went this year go that way again? Uh, so I do think that's worth keeping an eye on as well. If Emory Jones comes out here and throws another clunker out of a performance out there, who will be behind him? Because we know it's not Anthony Richardson. I know one of the in interesting parallels, I don't even know, maybe this is something they, they may talk about during the game, but you know, we talk about transfer portal and filling needs. Well, you know, UCF just lost Dylan Gabriel to UCLA, have a true freshman quarterback. You know, is he the quarterback of the future? Time will tell. But they want an experienced portal quarterback, and, and UCF has gone after guys 
Uh, you know, Bo Nix just committed to Oregon last night. I think they kicked the tires to try to get in with Adrian Martinez. He's going to Kansas State. Michael Penix is going from Indiana to Washington. He actually had visited UCF a couple weeks ago. So as you look at portal QBs and you look at, you know, if Emory Jones is going in there in a few days, I know that's a guy UCF could very well be interested in. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic when you kind of look at, you know, Emory Jones. You know, I don't know what kind of interest he would have, but I wouldn't be surprised if he hits the portal that he gets a call. Uh, from UCF, but you talked on it at the beginning a little bit about Greg Knox, interim coach. I just wanted to, is there a concern when you kind of have a, when you kind of, you do have a lame duck staff preparing for a game, you know, how much work are they putting into, you know, are they trying to find other jobs? Maybe, maybe they have other jobs lined up, just haven't been announced, but what kind of dynamic do you think that's going to have? Because for the most part, obviously Gus Malzahn's not going anywhere. Uh, we just got a report today that the quarterback coach, Coley C. G. J. Kitty, he's going to take the head coaching job at, at, in incarnate word. But obviously, they're motivated to put together the best game plan forward. Can the same be said with UF? Uh, is there a, a concern there when you kind of have a, a lame duck coaching staff? Well, yeah, you'd like to think that their focus would be here. They're kind of auditioning for their next job, as I said earlier. Greg Knox has uh, been in this position twice now, uh, taking over for Dan Mullen when Dan Mullen left Mississippi State to go to Florida, uh, won the Gator Bowl that year. Uh, beat FSU in the season finale uh, with a lame duck staff and Mike Norvell still couldn't get a win over uh, the uh, Greg Knox here as, a, as an interim coach. Uh, so you at least think from the top as the as the interim coach that that focus will be there for Greg Knox uh, as well. And, and from what we've heard, you know, even though things did not go well with this staff this year ultimately there's still a lot of respect for a lot of these staff members with these players as well so you think you know at least for each other uh for the coaching staff to put these players in the right position and for these players to go out there and you know show respect for their staff and go out there and give it their all you you hope that's out there but you know i, I do think a little bit of nature goes into this too i do think these coaches probably are looking within a, a you know, another foot forward of where their next job might be uh, and we've heard now, the only holdover that still might be in play for Florida would be Christian Robinson, the linebacker okay. coach. I don't think it happens. I do think uh, there will be a clean, brand-new staff for Florida uh, under Billy Napier. But there was some talk that Billy Napier was really going to watch Christian Robinson close these two weeks of bowl practice to kind of see how he had a relationship with the players and maybe, maybe keep him uh, with this staff. But – that's really about the extent of it. So I do think um, maybe hopefully just for themselves, even if it's selfish reasons, they want to go out there and play and coach well uh, for, uh, for for these Gators. Uh, Billy Napier, what's his role this week? Is he just kind of uh, an observer from afar? He's not really involved in the day-to-day. -day. Is he just kind of maybe observing practice? Will he, will he be on the sideline or will he be up in a booth maybe? A, what do you know about what his role is going to be this week? Yeah, I know he'll be close to the team on the sideline in practice uh, this week, as you said, kind of just an observer. Uh, no, There's no game plan whatsoever uh, from Billy Napier or his staff for, the, for, for this ball game here uh, versus UCF. But then the day of the game, I'm sure he'll be in, the, in, in a booth. Uh, you know how ESPN for these bowl games and there was a coaching transition. They'd love to get that new coach. Probably. Yeah, yeah. They'd love to get that coach in the, in the press box uh, during the game a little bit. So it wouldn't even surprise me to see Billy Napier get interviewed at some point if he's going to be at the game. I think that's the plan from what I heard. He plans to be at the game as well. Uh, of course, why wouldn't you be? It's right down the road. So pretty close uh, to Gainesville anyway. So, um, yeah, just an observer uh, and really just kind of, key in and get his first taste of this team besides what he sees on film. So in terms of, of the team we're going to see on Thursday, is it full strength? Are there players back that maybe were banged up that you expect to, to play? Uh, what I know we talked about, obviously, Emory Jones and, and uh, Jacob Copeland. Are, we're expecting them to play. Zach Carter, uh, defensive end, I believe he led Florida in sacks and TFLs. He's definitely out, correct? He opted out to prepare for the NFL. Are there some players that may or may not play beyond those names? Uh, we haven't really heard at all. We haven't really got any media, media availability at all uh, okay. for it. I think the Tuesday, we're, we're recording this on Monday. So Tuesday, I believe, is when we'll get the coaches for the first time. So, uh, but just kind of going off what we know and what Florida has kind of maybe fought with all year, we need to see who's going to be available up front for Florida and the offensive line. They have fought in, injuries up there all year long. Started the season running the ball really, really well this year versus Alabama and versus Tennessee, but they could not keep going, could not keep that going. And 
part of that was because they really got injured. They really got beat up up front. And one of their, if not the best offensive lineman, Ethan Wyatt, left guard, got injured about midway through the season, did not play uh, the rest of the season. So we'll see if he wants to go out there and play in this bowl game, if he's able to. Uh, but um, up front, it was I mean, it was mostly you know, dings. It, it would, they would miss. They'd get hurt early in the game, missed the rest of that game, but they'd play the next game. Or they missed just one game uh, besides Ethan White. He was the one who missed an extended period of time. So I'm interested to see if he will be out there uh, on, on the field for Florida. Uh, but as far as any other, um, Mamu Diabate also said he was transferring, but right. there's uh, some rumblings out there that he's injured as well. So he probably, whether he's transferring or not, may, he's Florida's leading tackler. Matter. So, yeah, uh, yeah he's a, and, he's, and he's Florida's leading tackler as well. So uh, would that you know come into play? Uh, as well, I'm trying to get word. There's some miscommunication, whether it's him or another linebacker uh, that's injured right now. So hopefully we'll get more word on that uh, when we meet with Greg Knox on Tuesday. But uh, I would say watch out for an injury there at the uh, linebacker position. But also, we need to detail it even more. Anthony Richardson will not play, goes right. through that meniscus surgery, uh, will miss this game. But so, look, this has been an injury for him that had played him since high school. Uh, been he was injured playing versus FSU and still was able to lead a a victory over FSU on, on on one good knee. So that's one bragging right Gator fans can have. Well, we beat you with a lame duck staff and a and a quarterback with a lame leg. So, uh, but uh, went ahead decided to get that surgery, skip the bowl game, so he could try and be ready in time for spring practice. As I said earlier, uh, there. So th- those are the major injuries I'd say for Florida. Maybe look out for Ethan White up front, Anthony Richardson missing the game, and some injury at linebacker as well. I just kind of wrap things up. I, I know you're in tune with the fan base and, and the Twitter and message boards and all that for years with Florida. What do you think their just general perception has been about the UCF program the past few years? Obviously, UCF had the tremendous run, like we talked about earlier, with Scott Frost and Josh Heupel, uh, the claimed national championship by A.D. Danny White. I know has always seemed to trigger a lot of people, particularly those in the SEC. Uh, and then now UCF's going to the Big 12 in a couple of years. Uh, I know the Big 12 is not the SEC, but I would argue the lineup this year, you know, it, would be the third best conference, you know, behind the SEC and in, in Big Ten. So there's some quality teams that are still going to be in that league, even when Texas and Oklahoma do depart. So what do you think kind of has been the Florida perspective? I know obviously you said it's been little brother, probably still will be regarded as such, but has has perspectives maybe changed as the UCF program has continued to build, particularly since the, the previous time the two schools play, 2006, UCF wasn't even playing in an on-campus stadium then. So how do you think perspectives have changed when you look at it through the UF lens? Well, I still think you respect what UCF has done because, it, it, as you said, it is better than what it has been. And they've put themselves on the map. They put themselves uh, in, in big games and performing in those big games uh, there. So now I think, I think, I think probably the biggest question is can 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 UCF get past the Scott Frost era because, you know, that's where the, the spotlight was on UCF and right. they were able to shine. Can they do it now with multiple coaches? And I think that's when maybe even outside of Florida takes UCF a little more serious. Okay, was it just like, I mean, Urban Meyer in Utah, you know, he was the first guy and then he set Utah up for success past right. that. Can UCF do the same thing with Scott Frost? Can Scott Frost come in, put UCF on the map, and then have that sustained success? Now, I think that's going to still take some time to maybe figure out if that's where UCF can can go and, and can become. I do think the move for the Big 12 is huge, uh, getting into that just the Power 5 label of it all, as you say. Even without Texas, without Oklahoma, it's still going to have that label to it. And then you'll play Florida <laughs> when you're in that conference as well. Right. So you, you go up and start play, playing – um, who, who I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure if, if I've missed it. Who else besides Florida does UCF? Are, are there other, what, you know, quote unquote, Power Five opponents that UCF will go out there and be able to prove well, that, themselves? That's, that's the issue. That's the issue that Danny White had when he was the AD. That yeah. no one would schedule UCF because they were pretty much emphatic that we got to play home and homes. And a lot of schools they wanted to, you know, they just didn't want to take that likely L. And that's why a lot of schools didn't play. So, you know, there's games upcoming. You know, next year UCF plays Georgia Tech and Louisville to back end at some home and homes. But those those non conference schedules are kind of lean here. Uh, there's a Maryland game in the future, North Carolina, but there's not a whole lot of games on there. But hopefully, for UCF's sake, you know, the Power Five label, you know, I know it means so much. We'll open up doors to schedule some bigger non conference games. And I guess there'll probably will be nine conference games. And, and yeah. has there been talk about the SEC playing nine conference games? Is that the expectation when, when Oklahoma and Texas come on board? 
it better be. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was like, I, I want nine conference games now. I've, I've, I've just been one of those to, to play one more conference game. I, I'm not a big fan of the cupcakes, you know, 55 right. nothing games. I just thought, yeah, give me, give me more of the, the top competition and, you know, give me some better TV games, give me some better games in the swamp uh, every other year. But uh, I think you have to, uh, and we'll see also, you know, it, you'll be at 16 teams then. Or do you go to a different, do you go to a pod system? What do you do with the SEC championship game uh, at that point as well? I think there's just so many questions about the future of college football, UCF going to the Big 12 and Texas and Oklahoma coming over to the SEC. I think nine, maybe even 10 conference games if you have to, just to kind of settle this thing, as I said, because I don't know what it means for a, a conference title game. Conference title games, to me, almost become useless now uh, if you start expanding the college football playoffs. There's no sense in really – you have them for seeding, I guess, but you don't really need them to get into the playoff if you start going, you know, 8, 12, 16 teams. So we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm excited for the future of college football. There's just still a lot, a lot of questions uh, to go along with it. My last thing, David, I know you do a great job with podcasts on YouTube, live streams. I was just on yours a little while ago. I know a lot of UCF fans kind of have a passing interest in UF. They got relatives or friends that are fans. So where can people find you? I understand that Gators Breakdown. Yeah, uh, Gators Breakdown. You can follow me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. I'm teamed with uh, WJXC Channel 4 here in Jacksonville. So my podcast is uh, – I've worked there for 15 years, but my podcast host there. Uh, you can find me on, on YouTube, all the famous podcast platforms out there as well. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you so much.